as I look down on all the people looking up at the big sky. Everybody's pushing one another around. The big sky feels sad when you see the children scream and cry. But the big sky too big to let it get him down. Oh, wait, hold on. I need to, um... Oh, never mind. <laughs> Welcome! Welcome to the two-month review of the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%. In which you take a giant book, break it down bit by bit, section by section, talk about it, analyze it, have some fun. I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox, who needs to go grab something. Oh, no, I just realized uh, I plugged my computer in, but it's not charging. So oh, we'll just go until the battery runs out. Yeah, well, that's that sounds <laughs> welcome. <laughs> well, good deal. So this yeah. this is our final episode on the Remembered Part, the third volume in Rodrigo Frazan's triptych. Um, we are covering the whole book. We are done all seven hundred and fifty whatever pages, sixty pages, um, and that's that. So this is it. We made it. The very first season was about the invented part, and season number nineteen comes to a close now finishing out the whole trilogy. So how do you feel, Brian? I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a good in a good way, but yeah, it, it was Woo, we made it. We made yeah, it. We, I I don't I didn't count it up, but it's got to be like 6 12, like almost 2000 pages. Yeah, I traveled I traveled with this book and I, at some point I just had to crack it in half. Because <laughs> uh, it, this it's very it takes up a weird amount of space in your briefcase when you're when you're traveling and flying and you're trying to put your put that under your put that under your seat. And I'm like, well, I can't. You know, I'm tall, and you know, this is a small plane, and this is a big book. So <laughs> every, every <laughs> time I every do? time I travel, and every time that I I get into something like this. I'm reminded more and more that I really like ebooks. I really like ebooks. <laughs> I think I have so many reasons to like them. Like, not only is it convenient, you can download things basically anywhere, anytime, but also, uh, you know, my eyesight's going. I'm old. So, like, I, I, I can just adjust things. I don't have to wear my, my stupid reading glasses, which I will always uh, on during this whole time. So, like, you know, I'm yeah, pro. My, my house is in storage right now. And hey, oh, I, I know. Can- <laughs> packing up packing up books and then moving books is like really annoying when you have a lot of books and I, I just keep thinking why couldn't I have collected stamps uh, so, or, so for anyone let's see if I can do this so here are a couple books that are supposed boxes that are supposed to go to the basement all these are supposed to go to the basement because all these are getting filled and all those are there's books everywhere and I don't want to carry any one of those down to the basement at all <laughs> period so they're going to sit there probably for the next year <laughs> no no i i wouldn't do that i'm you know get get some get some bulk if you uh carry that shit up and down the stairs no i had i had a good time i had a good time reading it i think it was very purposefully repetitive uh very purposely fragmented uh, we can get into that later obviously but um i i got the sense that uh, the author had a good time writing it, and that comes across when you're reading it. And so there's there's the joy in that. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it's very similar to like uh, Ducks Newberry Port, where you get the rhythms, you start like you you know you, oh I know it's going to be this 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 this, and then it'll connect it to something, and it's going to go on a side, and then it's going to you start like knowing the rhythms and knowing the patterns, and then you're like oh I've got 400 more pages. Which is fine, but sometimes you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to get off the ride now. And you're like, oh no, we're still going. Okay, here's another <laughs> hill. Here's another bump. Here's another corkscrew. <laughs> be fair. That's why I like reading it under for the guy under the guys or under the, the rubric or whatever the aegis of this uh, podcast is kind of the best way. Like you get your breaks in between. You read like a, a certain number of pages each week. So like the, even the repetitions don't feel super like as repetitive as they could. There's also like, they're kind of new at that moment um, in a way, or you can re-enjoy them without feeling like it's right on top of one another. Yeah. And like, and like, you know, like the writer says, uh, 
in this book, um, you know, there's these, these, these layers of art and it can be the human story. It can be connecting it to something more universal and truth. And then there's the stylist and mm -hmm. yeah, this, this was just highly stylized and that style persists. And I think that's what, what mattered most in this work. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get even deeper into it, though, we should take a moment to point out that Germany is not in the Women's World Cup anymore. And I just like to, <laughs> to just make sure that that is noted. Germany is not in the World Cup. What happened? They got kicked. They lost. They 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 drew, they drew with Korea and Morocco beat Colombia. So Morocco and, and Colombia move on. And Germany, the second ranked team in the world, is out at the group stage. Man, if if the USA can make it past Sweden, look out. <laughs> USA is going to get trounced. <laughs> they don't look good at all. Yeah, a, a fun aside with that is I really like how Carly Lloyd is being. Uh, people She's are upset. With her. Like, <laughs> yeah, what does she know about women's soccer? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> who, who, what right does she have to criticize women's soccer? My favorite US, U.S. women's soccer. It's like. These people that are mad are like, yeah, she's like done it and won it and was at the highest level. And she's saying this isn't good enough. Yeah. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> for, for, OK, so for anyone who doesn't doesn't follow Women's World Cup closely, which is tricky in the U.S., I have to admit, like the the timing on all this is so wacky. Like I have to readjust from the Latvia time, which was which was easy and everything was free online. But um, the Carly Lloyd criticized the U.S. team. People got pissed off. But what's awesome about that is just like in men's sports, there's always like the old people are like, it was better when I played. <laughs> like this, this stuff is shit. And people get really yeah. pissed at them. And that's the same across genders. And I love that. That's pun like the pundit sport punditry is bullshit, no matter if you're male or female. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I've watched every – I've watched every match, and uh, yeah, USA is not looking great. She, she's have, kind of there's no. I, I, no I can't speak. I can't speak to their efforts, but I can definitely speak to, speak to like man, the 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 offense and the the connection between the defense and the offense looks awful. One of my favorite criticisms of like sport hot takes is when they're talking about like effort and intensity, actually, because it's like. It's like, especially related to baseball, they're like, he's not intense enough. And it's like, what does that even fucking matter? Like, what is he supposed to be there being like, urgh, urgh, I'm going to give it a crush. Like, that doesn't mean anything. The other thing I noticed too, uh, watching this, and it reminds me of the part where the writer was talking about Nicole Kidman in here. Oh, and like, yeah. I, I always wonder, like, do I have like the, when I'm watching Women's World Cup, do I have like this like bad male gaze when I'm, because like, I can't help but watch some of the teams and like, ooh, which which players do I find attractive? I like that player, you know, like that that aspect to it. But then I realize I do the I do the same thing with the men. Like, oh, I totally do that, dude. I like I like number I like number fifteen for uh, some country I've never heard of. Like, that's my favorite player. Why? Look at I, him. Look at him. He's gorgeous. He's gorgeous. It's interesting that like, I only like I like sports just to just to look at the uh, human specimens basically. I, mean, <laughs> I don't even know if I like athletics. Soccer players are fit as shit, man. Like that is the most fit uh, sport athlete I think. I also think that it's the sport with the least amount of body variance. Like almost everyone looks the same. Like they're all like the same sort of like some fairly slender, strong legs. Like they like look very similar in like in their like athleticism compared to like football where you have like the 900 pound fat guy sure. on the front line and then like the super thin seven foot tall wide receiver like there's like more physical variance but soccer is like a real is one where it's like wow all these people like aside from their haircuts which is why the men spend so much time on their haircuts and oh their, their, their look and they're like almost indistinguishable from behind although i did go to um and we'll get into the book i did go to Oh, I do have Latvian jokes for everyone. I did go to a Latvian soccer match, like I told you, and and that the the variance is pretty wild. There's a guy who's like my size, and then there'd be someone who's like six foot six and like a hundred pounds larger, and just is dominating against like I like the guy that looked like me looked like he was like a JV player from a high school that just wandered onto the field, and everyone else was like a real person, like a girl. My two my two favorite type of football players are. The, the Eastern European football player, uh, usually like a Slav, that looks like they're trying out for like a Russian mafia 
tattoo job. Like we're just like, wow, that person has some haggard, haggard. They like tattoos. pull their shorts way up when they do the free kick. Like they're like, yeah, like yeah. getting ready. Like they're gonna go swim the ocean and they're in their I, speedos. Yeah, I, and I love the. I love the skinny white dude with like neck tattoos and kneecap tattoos. And then, oh, yeah. um, then I love the Central American soccer player that has really bright hair, but somehow carved things, <laughs> short hair with, with carved things like randomly all over the place. Like, like the same way you'd see like a car that's like a really cheap car that gets fixed up with all these little add-ons. Like that's their hair. <laughs> Those are my two favorite. Like, yeah. It's a great. It's, I love yeah. women's soccer so much. World Cup is great. Competition yeah. so much. So, anyways, you not right now, buddy. When you're done. Okay. Um, okay. So about the book. So we read. So we read a book. Yeah. You read a book. Also, I'm back from Latvia, where the Latvia the only the only the only joke I have about Latvia this week is that their their meat is so wet. All their meat is so wet in Latvia. Gross, gross, like it's Chad. Grossest stop. thing ever. Stop. It's so gross. There's the phrasing. I know. There's worse right, phrasing, so, but seriously, like everything's so just your, there. So your favorite part in this book was the very hard to read typewriter part about the karmas, I bet. <laughs> was it? In this section? Yeah. That yeah. Was, okay, that, part is great. that part is great. That part is wonderful. That's, that's a great I, bit. Like, fill up with karmas is like from that part right before then. So our, our protagonist, the ex writer is on his way to Mount Abracadabra to find Penelope's son, his nephew um, to rescue him because apparently as it turns out in here, um, they didn't want mama grandma didn't want him. Penelope was going to the insane asylum and she didn't want him a loser writer all writers are losers. There's nothing worse than being a loser writer. Um, to raise her her grandson, um, so she had people like essentially kidnap him on the night in question. That's been through all three books, in which something weird happened. He wanders off. They can't find him, so on and so forth. Supposedly the the Karmas have kidnapped him and taken him both back to Mount Abracadabra, have him in a private school, blah 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 blah. And so the ex writer's on the way there. Then on the way there, he is stuck in an airport where the Karmas are. They're all filling up the same airport. And he reads his sister's journal, Karma Confidential, which in the American typewriter script, which has sort of been, we've talked about like what its function has been or what it represents before is like the other part of his mind and if in a, in a bicameral mind situation or Penelope's voice or whatever, something from the beyond. And here's Penelope and it's just a string. How many pages does this go on for? It's just a string of like, of different observations or jokes. It's uh, 12 pages long, 13 pages long with just like um, slash line in between the different observations and sort of yes. ask jokes. Starts um, on 7 11 is when it starts. It ends at 723. Um, yeah. But there's ones like, like it's just observations about the karmas. All of them sing all of the time, suddenly and without warning, like in musical comedies. For some strange reason, they all seem absolutely convinced that they sing very well, but they don't. End bit. Another one, thinking about thinking the same thing is a way to think about nothing. Like there's these little witty aphorisms and observations. But yeah, I love this part. If so, if somebody knows, I would I would love to know if like with the if you're speaking Mexican style Spanish, do they have the vocal? Can you do the vocal fry like they do in Los Angeles? Because I I. I, I hear that when I'm thinking of karma. It's like it makes you think of Kardashians or the, the Kardashians um, um, like right the oh my god like every like <laughs> and when I'm reading this I have that vocal fry going and I'm I'm curious is there something similar to that? Yeah, if anyone's <laughs> listening that as an answer to that, please let us know. I'd I would I yeah. would love to know if uh, <laughs> terrible uh, <laughs> myopic uh, high society Mexican family will have that same. <laughs> sound <laughs> in the beginning was the word and the word was bye <laughs> Adios. i love it i love it it's so good just rubbing this i wish i could stay pregnant for three years <laughs> yeah it, it, it sounds just like um it's like a little bit like lola from uh um uh what's that the the masturbation show cartoon um fuck the one that nick kroll show Oh, Big Mouth? 
Big Mouth. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Lola from Big Mouth has that same had story. Me, had to be lost there, but I don't know what cartoons you're watching. I think it's called Hit Hentai. Um, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I don't know where this is going, Chad. I'm really confused, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you've ever seen Big Mouth Masturbation, the show is pretty bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. Yep, yep, yep. So what does what part did you like? What did you... So you've been off for a few weeks. You missed the, uh, the solo episode, the least listened to episode in the history of the podcast, <laughs> which, which is unfortunate because that was... I left it all on the field there, man. <laughs> like you, that's... And that's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kaya filled in last week was something that I do want to come back to at the end. If you didn't listen to it, sure. then do the next book that we have a phrase on Melville that's coming out because it seems mm-hmm. almost like a thematic continuation of the end of this book um, where well, we'll get to it later. But, um, but otherwise, what did you, what are you, you're catching up on the whole thing. Have you had uh, thoughts, concepts that pieces that you wanted to talk about? Um, again, if it's already been discussed, we can move, move right along. But, um, I was, I was really interested with the idea of fragmentation in, in this book in particular, um, especially like when we're connecting it with some of the, the pop culture references, right. With the albums in particular, these, these weird, like breakup fragmented albums that are like barely stitched together, but that's what makes them kind of interesting. That's what makes them wonderful. That's what makes them to listen over and over again. Like, like when we talk about Tusk and Fleetwood Mac, right. And Mm -hmm. gosh, the band can't stand each other and they're all in their own separate rooms. Well, this is my song. This is my song. Like it doesn't go together at all. Like it's bonk. It's bonkers. You you feel like you're having a stroke when you're listening to that album or the Beatles album or, you know, or even, even some of the film references. Um, and and I like how this that 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 fragmentation was mirrored in this as well, and like maybe there's some parts that are frustrating with it. Where like really this again? I have to listen to this rant again, or you know, but how this how he's fragmenting these things together to to tell the story? Because I mean, the the ending is you know it's it's so sweet and it's it's almost like like. I don't know. You want to like smack your lips and, and like swallow it out of your mouth because it's so cloyingly sweet and endearing. And you're like, really, really, really? And, and even the writer knows like, yeah, really, really, really. <laughs> Maybe. I have a couple of things on that. But real quick, we had uh, someone commented about how they're surprisingly like that sentence and section since, since it is such a splenetic rant that didn't adequately support its emotional climax. And I wonder, this is from uh, Benjamin Chambers, who I know started by reading this book. I think um, I think the, that section is a bit of a good is a bit of a callback, like because the karmas have been throughout the other two books, and they're always like this foil, really, this, really big in the first, really big in the first in particular, yeah. yeah, with the whole story of Penelope, the green cow thing, the diamonds, the marriage, all that stuff is all takes place there. Um, that it it's kind of like a a shorthand gag. Like it, I think it's I think it's funnier with all the the past references to the karmas than it would be coming at it for the first time because I don't I mean we just read this book I don't remember how much the karmas are described in here aside from this section. Yes, yeah, I not a ton. I don't think that they're here as much, but they're like a they're like a big figure and they are like a centerpiece of the book mantra, which is still coming um, out later. That is essentially the karma story or part the karmas are part of that and that is the book that like the x writer refers to frequently as the book about mexico that he was commissioned to write that in real life in the real life um uh had analogy um whatever the analog is this book mantra so there is some there's more to it so i think like that 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 whole universe it makes it make more sense or land a little bit better than it does if without the context of the karmas. But let's talk about the end. So, so the end really is like, so the part that you're talking about being saccharine is that he goes there, he goes to private school, he waits, the kids come out, he finds Penelope's son, his nephew, and he embraces him to like lead him off into, I don't even know what the final line is, probably just the end. Um, well, aside from the end, uh, the Oh, yeah, that they'll go off somewhere and he'll think of something, he'll do something. Okay, so 
my question for you to complicate this. Well, first, what's your take on that? And then I have, then I have two complications. Oh, I don't have a take on it. I mean, I liked, um, I don't know. I like, I like uh, w it, the way it kind of reconnects with, you know, the obsession with Blade Runner and the obsession with uh, 2001, where there's like this kind of absent father or searching for the father kind of aspect to those and yeah. some of the questions that those raise. And then there's kind of like this, um, the, the book was feeling like it was nihilistic, right? What happens to a writer that can't write? He's burning book. He's no longer read. Like you're not reading. You're not writing. Like oh, this is the end. This is the and it's like no, I I have this, I have this, and so there. This is something to live. So it's kind of like a little bait and switch with with that part, um, and it was unexpected. Um, but at the same time, yeah, like I could see the mile markers pointing to that. So it, it's very satisfying in that uh, it has that inevitability, but it's also has some unexpectedness to it as well. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, to have like such a sincere sort of ending to a book that's like loaded with irony and and mm -hmm. is like real different. So, but I have a, okay, so. I'm it's, and that's and that's super tough to earn, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a really hard thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I think it works because it's not too, I mean, it's pretty saccharine, but it's not too, and I don't know. I'm just not too far in that regard. I don't think. I mean, it could be mm -hmm. way cheesier. I mean, the, the cheesiest part is like when he walks up and he asks, "Do you remember me?" And the boy, looking at him as if you were first an invention and then a dream and at last a memory, answers, "Of course, I remember you." And then they he takes out Mr. Trip, blah blah blah. blah. Um, okay, but so here's a question. So I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they put. Oh, sorry. So that is the intro song and exit <laughs> intro song now. <laughs> I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything at all. Um, so, okay. So the ending is cloying. Uh, uh, ben, Benjamin chimed in again, said that the ending is cloying and hard to accept. Book strength lie elsewhere. So here is what I'm going to like try. And I don't know that I have not thought this through. I'm just going to go with it. So page 740. We have the bit where he talks about seven, the seven capital scenes, as postulated by that book, the manual for people who want to become writers. And the seven capital scenes are one, to vanquish the monster, two, rags to riches, three, the search, four, the comedy, five, the tragedy, six, the rebirth, and seven, the journey out of the shadows and into the light. Okay, so, and then there's plot eight, which for him was like the eighth passenger bursting out from the insides and not from the brain, devouring all the previous capital scenes one by one. Okay, and then the next page, he's he goes on to talk about being where the green cow was that Penelope drank the milk from, so on and so forth. And I think it's implied that she got like some of her ideas from there. And after drinking that milk, what he's allowed to see and to live are random scenes from alternate realities around his reality. Answers to a multiple choice test, cells interlinked within cells interlinked within cells interlinked within one stem that was him, as if they were memories based on his memory. Des designed and modified by the young Dr. Anna Celine, the catalog of furniture to decorate his interior life with, the things he would see and that nobody would believe. Now, so this Anna Celine, that is from Blade Runner 2049, um, which I still have yet to see. Have you seen that? I said I was gonna okay. watch I said I was gonna watch it after the one that one that I did alone that had a lot to do with it and with Pale Fire being in it. Um, mm -hmm. but I just <clears throat> didn't. And so I tried to watch uh, Fate of the Furious because I'm obsessed with uh, these movies right now because they're so fucking dumb. <laughs> they're so fucking dumb. Um, but anyways, I haven't watched it, but that's the Blade Runner thing in reference to like the replicants in reference to the fake memories in reference to uh, what you believe. And also this thing of like alternate realities, which sort of ties back to the invented part and his concept of going in, getting hit by the God particle, being out and, you know, being able to rewrite everything in history to his own regard that these and things makes and it makes me also think of the the referenced philip k dick short story yes yeah 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 where the where the artificial you know the the, the spaceship computer is going to give you a memory to <laughs> since right. since you you since you've woken up from your dream before you're supposed to right. let me give you a dream yeah Right. So like, so then what follows are sections that are lettered A, B, C, D, so on and so forth. 
and each one of them sort of relates to these seven capital scenes. And if you take this at verbatim, they are random scenes from alternate realities around his reality, including ones that are like clearly go against everything that we've seen so far, like number B, in which he, um, that the Pertusato uh, and Nicolasito lives instead of dies and becomes Ikea, and yet Ikea's book, and then there's Ikea, Ikea's book comes out in number C, and he thinks it's pretty good, it's better, and it's not that this seems good to him, but doesn't seem bad either. These are alternate reality things. App, Mama Grandma's in, in a cave, they're going to shoot each other, there's a big firefight, um, mm -hmm. H, I, J, blah, 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 and then this section is X, is the eighth one. So is this section even real? Or is this a version of an alternate reality? Is this a Jacob's Ladder situation? <laughs> in which no, I, I, I thought that too, because it, it also kind of reminds me of, you know, that the ending for Blade Runner, the, the 1982 one, right? Like, yeah. Is this a happy ending? Yeah. <laughs> right, as they're, as they're driving off, him and Rachel and, you know. <laughs> and here's, a, here's another that would be really funny, is what if this was just some random fucking kid? <laughs> It's not, it's, not, it's not him at all. It's not Penelope's not, son. It's not his nephew. Oh. It's a kid that's like wandering out of school. He's like, do you remember? He's like, yeah, of course I do. Yeah, totally. And like this random X writer who's living in that, who's sent in the exile because his book pissed off everyone and the government just kidnaps this random kid and they're going to go off. There's, there's, this, there's this YouTube channel that I follow. It's called There I Ruined It. And yeah, it's this oh, yeah. person that, that takes songs and he he just he's like oh I can ruin I can ruin Frank Sinatra by mixing it with you know something that's terrible. Uh, that you're basically doing that with books. There I ruined it. What if it's just a random kid that he's getting a kidnap and the kid's like sure, Mister. <laughs> exactly. Are we going? There doesn't have to be candy in the back of the van. I'll go back there. Don't worry. <laughs> there, I ruined it. This, this 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 sweet sentimental moment is like, oh no 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 no. no. Maybe just bullshit. Maybe just. <laughs> I mean, I, I I take it at face value, and I know that like the re reason I wanted to mention the thing from last week is that Melville is about um, Herman Melville's dad essentially telling stories to his son, and the idea of that being like the seed for all of his imagination and creation and storytelling and mm -hmm. uh, like the father son relationship. And that is like a, um, a gift, uh, which we call it inheritance, so on and so forth, being part of that, that, that book sort of uh, theme ties into this as like he reunites with this, with the nephew is going to be sort of a stepfather to him. And then we get Melville in which there is a relationship between a father and a son and the storytelling bit again, which, which I don't think uh, Vander Heiden sent in the full manuscript yet, but it's, it was, I think it was due few, four days ago. So it should be yeah. here soon enough. And we should have done it soon enough. My, my gut reaction uh, with this was he never made it out of the particle um, accelerator. And I take it as being that he was successful in that. And this is all, yeah, like, all these fragments are these Jacob Jacob's ladder type type things, including this uh, invented um, thing with the child. And you know, I could be completely wrong and off base, and maybe it's the Mona Lisa smile where it's not important to know what's the right answer or not. It's what did you perceive from reading it? Um, yeah, I, I took it as he successfully died at the uh, at CERN, and this is you know the, the fragments, the remnants, the the you know the 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 radiation fuzz of the universe uh, or, is, is what is or, we have here, or he drowns at the very beginning of the first book. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it could go even even before. That's when he knew he was going to be a writer. Is as he was drowning, he he saw everything that he could write and his whole future ahead of him, and there we are. <laughs> Except that falls apart because how could he? He wouldn't have been able to have you know. Uh, there's too many references that are after when the drowning would take place that actually did take place. So it, you couldn't hallucinate things that haven't existed yet. <laughs> Says you. <laughs> that that we know about, that, <laughs> that actually came true. Maybe we're just know. part of the hallucination. Maybe yeah. this is all a simulation. Um, yeah. Speaking of Mona Lisa, did you see that crazy, I don't know if it's real or not, but the viral meme of like where they asked the AI, 
whatever to to generate a, a drawing of Mona Lisa from 2023. And it's just like so it's so like I don't even want to, I don't even have the words. Like it's it's more much more salacious than I mean it's as salacious as you might expect from an AI in 2023 drawing the Mona Lisa, but it's like such a different vibe. It's so weird. So weird. I hate this AI stuff so much. Yeah, the only thing I like from AI is the when the people make commercials with them. Yeah, the commercials are wonderful. The commercials are kind of genius. Can you make me a pizza commercial from the 80s? There you go. And they're like, yeah. they got like 12 fingers. And like nothing <laughs> makes any sense. <laughs> that is that is really the top the top of it all. So, you know, when you say that about the, the dying in CERN and never getting out, I can't, let me see if I can find I don't remember where it is in here, but there's a moment where he's in the bar and they, they, it's reporting on him being in CERN. <clears throat> yeah, which, yeah, the, 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 that idea of like reflections. I really like is. that. To, to, to see himself like on the security camera to see like, I know this person. I recognize that. Per Wait, that's me, right? Right. So, yeah. so this is on page 726 where he's there, blah, blah, blah. It says, he recounts how it was reported that authorities had finally, quote, declassified information about what had happened on the previous Tuesday at the CERN particle accelerator in Switzerland. Like, what the fuck time is? How long does this take place? Like, like if that took place the previous Tuesday, like that's at most a week and a couple of days ago that he got out of there, goes through all of this. Like the timeline of like these three books is really like compressed and nonsensical and not important because there's a lot of talk yeah. of like the Billy Pilgrim, the time space continuum being broken, so on and so forth, everything that goes wrong with that. However, it is, if you're trying to like, if you want to make that argument, if you want to make the argument that he's still in that particle accelerator and things that work, this is a piece that would point to that. And also, that's, yeah, that, that's where that kind of like my spidey senses jumped was there. Because mm -hmm. then, like, it obviously it doesn't have to make sense clearly. But right. then, that's like the idea of like IKEA pays the bail money and, and gets them out and stuff. I'm thinking, well, I, you know, obviously, I, I don't want to like, I'm okay suspending disbelief, but it's like, man, how much would bail be if you held somebody hostage? And like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure they just will let you go right away. And like a week later, you're at a bar, like, yeah, that's me holding people yeah. hostage. I'm going to be going to jail pretty soon here. Uh, <laughs> <for> good, <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're probably like, do not flee laws in place too. <laughs> you don't need to do it and go through America to Mexico. Inter Interpol is going to swoop you up pretty quick there uh, <laughs> as you <laughs> fly out of the country. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, so yeah, so things don't quite go quite on. Uh, no, no, but yeah, so I, I thought, oh, I, he may not have never made it out of there. Okay, that, that might, okay. <laughs> that might be the moment we're all living in. Yeah, yeah. That, that's fun. It's super fun. Overall, like the book is really enjoyable. I mean, it's just really fun. It's got so many ideas, too many ideas, and to certain people, I'm sure, um, it is overloaded with stuff. But I, I love it. Like it's mm -hmm. it's it's fun, and like that's why I went right from like last week's episode and just read the rest of the book because I'd been sort of waiting to like get to that, get to that, get to this point where I can finish it all off and be there. So, yeah. Season 19, we made it from made it. from several time zones. From uh, yeah, it's been a, been a <laughs> wet meat, been a fun one. Wet wet meat to uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but like like bacon is not crispy, and like and not like it's not like Canadian bacon. It's like just wet, and like the even the hamburgers are like they're not juicy. They're just there's like a there's a, like a consistency issue, as if they'd like stuffed the meat full of like some sort of water product to like make it different it's so bizarre um <clears throat> i'm so glad to be back here where you get like crispy you know <laughs> firm meat i'm so happy for firm meat instead of something i feel like i have to to drink um yeah i don't know is there any other parts from this like we we split this up so so that these last few parts are like so short um by contrast but i don't know if there's anything else from this section we get the kinks back again which is fun um and other than that, yeah, I've got a line I want to read. I've got to see if I can find it real quick. Um, boy, oh boy, it might be from like 200 pages ago, but we'll see. I know there's like that's one of the problems. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, come on, so much Blade Runner. 
Where, no, here it is. Mine was uh, from page 587. Solid. So a while back, but this was a, a line I love. Um, it's at the very top. And that's what happened, and that's what he said. And the scientist let him speak, like someone putting up with the tantrum of a spoiled child, silently staring at him. I almost feel like it's this this reference of like the reader is the scientist and the writer is this tantrum, like this spoiled child. Let me tell you about the Beatles. Let me tell you about, have I ever told you about uh, Station to Station, David Bowie? I used to bring women back to my place and I would, you know, explain these albums to them and they would just kind of like stare like stare at the spoiled child like, okay, are we doing the, the David Bowie thing again? Oh, please tell me how Nabokov did this. Please tell me how. There's just, also, you know, let, just to go back to this this thing again, because you reminded me, because I was flipping back to like the lines that Steve I had marked one as a line of the week, <clears throat> is that he has the brain tumor and is losing his memory. And like the the flipping between burning the pages in the desert and getting his his nephew from the school are both in some ways in this book presented as a contemporaneous events. So he may be just completely fucked up and not, not <laughs> none of this is going it. None of this is happening. Perhaps he'd read too many comic books and seen too many B science fiction movies when he was a kid, because things don't work like that. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I, I just love the idea of the scientist just staring at him and just letting this spoiled child go on this rant. He's like, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I know that there there had been some readers that are like, man, I really don't like, I really don't like this this writer because it just they just keep going on and on and on. And it's like, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure I, fully un- I fully understand the characters like this. This, <laughs> this reference to it here maybe <laughs> made me chuckle. So. As a way, I'm going to, I don't know if you have another line that you want to read, but the, the, the one that I have is not even really like my favorite line of the week, but it's a perfect segue, is on 740. The plot that, that suddenly, this is where you're talking about the different plots, and you're talking about the eighth plot eight. The plot that suddenly sees itself from outside and asks itself what's going on and what can I do to get out of here, out of this loving and burning building, and at last enter what's over there, or vice versa, which is very similar to Mulligan Stew which is our next book in which there are characters that are stuck in a book that are trying to get out of that book because the writer sucks <laughs> and is way more, way more awful than the writer and the ex-writer in here in a totally different, different pretentious way. Um, and less, maybe he's got some rants. He's surely got some rants, but less of like the repetitive rants and more like just unhinged, <laughs> like bad academic, <laughs> pure melancholy rants. Um, and his writing is terrible and the characters within his writing are trying to escape. And that is essentially where we can begin with Mulligan Stew in a few weeks and a month. Um, but yeah, I thought that that was too, uh, that was super funny that like that plot eight is essentially the plot of the next book that we're reading for a two month review. Oh, I can't wait. That yeah, I got your copy. Fantastic. Like this. this is, this is the first time I've been able to talk about it with the new version here. Um, so, you know, beautiful blue spine for anyone who's watching, fun cover with a guy who looks like he's like either constipated or going insane. Um, <laughs> it feels so sexy to hold. There is an earlier version of this that was published by Delkey for so many years that a lot of people own that. And um, I doubt this person is listening, but there is a comment on the website that I'll reply to today asking if you can follow along and still and still participate in the conversation if you don't buy the new version, which of course that's totally fine. And when I post the reading schedule, I will try and match up the pages between the old and the new versions so that we have both of them listed since I think there are probably a considerable number of people like with JR that have the old version and not the Mm -hmm. new one. Um, The new one is much easier to read, by the way. It's not as crammed on the page. So if you do, if you are one of those people who likes like the much more readable version i highly recommend this it's like a better size and everything um but uh but i'll put both page numbers on there because the the original donkey is the one that looks like it was made with microsoft paint right it basically was made like with super, paint. it's like super 90s it looks really like 90s are back in like that that thing <laughs> you're gonna want that original version <laughs> and it's nine by six so it's bigger than this one in this way but like the font like for anyone looking, the font on here is legible. The font on that one is very tight. 
it's yeah. very tight for whatever reason. So it's like just not as easy to like to read through. And this book is wild. There are like there's a mathematical, like a straight up mathematical text within the middle of it. There's like lots of lots of bits that are just like kind of bizarre that we'll just have to puzzle out list upon list upon list sections where he asks himself questions that don't really have logical answers. It's all everything you can think of is in this book. There's a play um, that's based off of like a Ulysses off of the Ulysses. Play. <laughs> there's like any kind of shit you can imagine will be. There's a baseball scorecard as pointed out in the, the essay about this. There's it is a a grand in the grand tradition of Delkey books in which a book is about someone writing a book. There's also baseball. And so that that's fun. There's drawings, any any and everything you can think of. It's in here. So. Be sure right and uh, someone says, hi, what about the old gray covered gray press paperback? I'm 90% sure that that is the same as the Delkey one in terms of page numbers, Paul. Um, I'm almost positive. I don't have that one uh, physically here, so I can't check it. Um, but I'm certain that uh, the the purple, the purple Mulligan stew from like 96 or whatever it is that, or maybe it's before then, that, uh, that Delkey did was just an offset printing of that other one, this one is a whole new scan, retype set, redesigned, and as a result of that, there is an ebook version for everyone who is a pro ebook reader. <laughs> this one won't break. I mean, look at the difference in size between these two books. This is like <laughs> ridiculous. Like I used to think Mulligan Stew is like one of the biggest books I've read. Like it's so long. It's like five hundred and twenty-two pages in here, and that is oh. like. Hold my beer. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> every, time, every time I set this down, the table shakes. Like, it's so intense. I don't know. You got any final words for this season? No, it's awesome to uh, finish the trilogy. And I hope you guys uh, maybe package something together where you could buy all three. I hope I hope there's like a box set. That'd be really cool. There's, there's one place that can make the boxes. We just have to put the books in ourselves. So... And, and since the university decided to take away all of our packing space and, uh, and okay. you know, all the space for our library and, you know, offices, uh, it'll be a little tricky, but we'll figure it out. You know, <laughs> awesome. There ain't, nothing like a, there ain't nothing like a university to make your life easier. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, another, another season in the books. Can't wait for 20. Number 20. 20. We're getting old. Yep. 20. Until then. Rate and review us on X or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, then wherever you get your podcast, tell your friends, download, listen, follow along. If you read the 3% website, um, which is very easy to find, it's just 3%. Uh, that's It's not 3%.com. It's on the Rochester thing, so you kind of have to search for it. But it's rochester.edu slash 3% written out. Um, there are posts every single day this month for Women in Translation Month, and that is where you will get the full – schedule for season 20 for Mulligan Stew, which pages, which weeks, and all that information. Um, I believe we will have some guests on next season, um, a variety of different people. So we'll try and either have those at, as add-ons or live on the, this recording. Um, till then, I mean, uh, think about the children. <laughs> <laughs>